John Laub, when we talk about rookie sleepers, I mean, it, I, I don't mean to use it as a tongue in cheek word, but what does the word sleeper really mean as we apply it to like giving people advice in your judgment? I've come to a different conclusion because I do think the word is a little overused. And you think right now, before, you think before, yeah. <laughs> before we get ADP, I like to think of it as players that I've seen in mock drafts that go after the top 36 are on the board. I believe for the most part, we know the top 24. I mean, obviously, some people at the, the 21 to 26 can jump in and out of the second and third round. But even the top 36, now there might be changes if it's number 28 to 34. But once you get into number 37, Alan, I believe that that's where your dynasty drafts are won and lost. Because we we both play in deep leagues. And to have flex players who can score double-digit points, yeah. Alan, with injuries and bye weeks, or just to have a trading valuable player is so important. And I've mentioned this in my write-up for Player Profiler. If last year you drafted Quinton Johnson in round one, which one out of 12 owners did, you could have saved your draft taking Tank Dell or Puka Nakua in rounds three or four. Yeah. Puka might have even been in round five, my friend. That changes your entire outlook. And at times, I think we focus too much on the top 24. And I get you don't want to get in a landmine. I understand that. But we, you know, you can judge that and value it. But can I find a usable piece as as a chance here or as an example? I made the playoffs and the semifinals with Chuba Hubbard as my running back who I drafted in the fourth round three years ago, I think it was now. He was a valuable backup flex running back. So you've got to be able to navigate those later rounds in your dynasty drafts. Yeah, you nailed it. Like the running backs that you can get in round five of your rookie drafts, I mean, they are, quote, sleepers. Ty Chandler. I mean, I had the whole Ty Chandler for like two years before I got a couple of usable weeks, but – that's the expectation. Obviously, everything's roster size dependent and all that. And I think you're right about the first round. One of 12 owners took Quentin Johnston. And it really like when you're trying to decide when you're on the clock, it's not which wide receiver should I take? Sure. You might have a preference last year with Jordan Addison over Quentin Johnson or vice versa. But I think this year it's it's going to be interesting where it's you're making positional decisions, right? Like am I yes. taking Roma Dunze or QB three or Drake May, who say potentially is a Patriot. So, and, and I'm going to ask you those questions. Um, yeah. I mean, like when we talked about sleepers years ago, it was literally like players that most of your league didn't know about, right? Like yes. you, nowadays, yes. like the most casual player knows who the third wide receiver is on some obscure team, but with Sunday ticket, with social media, and frankly, with guys like you really uh, grinding rookie content and you know putting out a lot of good quality stuff. Everyone knows who like the taxi squad guys are on all of these different teams, John. Oh, I can you remember the '90s? I mean, I do, and of playing <laughs> and playing fantasy football back then. I got Terrell Davis and Isaac um, Bruce. Isaac Bruce, like literally in the last two rounds of a draft, and you win your keeper league three of the next four years because of that. Those days are long gone, Alan. Because there's, I mean, the good news is there's so much information, and our yeah. hobby has grown so much. It's great. It's good and bad. But it's good yeah, and bad. You don't you don't find those players very often. I think that's why everyone talks about Puka Nakua. I mean, it's right. hard to go on a rookie show and someone doesn't bring up his name well, because you know that what? is so so yeah. rare. I, I, I love that you just underlined him. And yeah, we talk about him a lot, but here's really the question that I'm trying to figure out. Is there any repeatable process or repeatable analysis that we could apply to this year to find the quote next Puka Nakua? Or was that just complete? Like there's no way you could have seen it and there's no way you're going to see the next one. I think the best process is readjusting after the draft. I can have my pre-draft rankings and all of that. 
but he landed in an optimal situation with Sean McVay, a veteran quarterback, and a good wide receiver, very good, on the way down. You know, looking back, we should have all recognized that the Rams, we love McVay five years ago. They took a step backwards. But does that mean McVay stopped learning how to coach offensive football? And you drop him in there, and we should have known on that. Right, right, yeah. Um, when we're trying to identify these rookie sleepers for this year, what do you think is the key metrics? Or what do you look at? Because, all right, we all basically know who the first round of your rookie draft is going to be. There's going to be maybe some quarterbacks, like the Penix and Bo Nix that get shuffled in and out. But when you're talking about um, you know, mid to late second round and then also third round guys, how are you identifying? Let's start with just like, what are the profiles of quote sleepers? And then we'll get into some specific names, John. So one stat that I've really kind of been attracted to, and I don't believe there's any one stat per se, but I'm really into receiving yards per team pass attempt. Did okay, so the young man dominate in his offense at the college level? And when I see a player who has a very high receiving yards per team pass attempt and it's late in the draft, I feel as if you've got to pick up that player, that he's got value there. And then when you combine that, and, and I'm calling this the trifecta, PFF dot receiving yards per team pass attempt and yards per reception – Okay, when hold on. You, Stop right there. Stop right there. Yeah. I want to talk about the th – okay, I just want to make sure I understand. So say them again slow. The first one was uh, A dot, so average depth of target. Yes, that okay. means the offensive team and coaching staff has confidence to throw the ball deep to this player. Okay, so number two is what? Receiving yards per team pass attempt. Okay, so how many actual yards they get on every pass attempt. So yards yes. per attempt receiving. Yes. Okay, yes. and then number three? is yards per reception, just your basic old, okay. did they catch it? And what did they do with yak yards? Because okay. if you have the right player, they're receiving their yards per reception should be higher than their A dot. Right. Okay. Because someone like Malik Neighbors, who's after the catch, is going to have yes. maybe a lower A dot, but maybe a greater yards per reception. Okay. Yes. I got it. I got it. All right, so continue on. So you have those the trifecta. When I see those and there's a player in the fourth or fifth round, I'm going to draft that player at every opportunity. Obviously, landing spot will matter a little bit. I'm not foolish on that, yeah. right? Yeah. But if the opportunity is there in the landing spot and they have those numbers, I'm all in, Alan. Okay. Like, <laughs> I'm going to draft that player. All right, so let's peel away the tape for our first uh, sleeper that does have those intriguing, those three, the trifecta, John. Who's somebody that you like on the wide receiver position to start? Here's the player who I can't believe isn't getting enough press. And I've seen people, NFL guy, and I don't, the NFL media is great. I'm not, you know, but you can have difference of opinions on them. I have seen this player outside the top 20. This is his trifecta. I cannot believe it, Alan. When I looked at the numbers in December, A dot 17.1. He is in the top four of the class. My benchmark is 12. So he shatters the A dot. Who is it, Johnny? Who is it? Oh, oh okay. I was going to do a little sneaky. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. No, keep going. Keep going. We'll do the slow reveal. It's like, the you know, reveal. it's like, you know, strip club style. You know, they have little. <laughs> <laughs> I, unfortunately, I know that reference. Yeah, um, yeah. Receiving yards per team pass attempt, 3.11. My benchmark, 2.5. He shatters both. And this I love. His yards per route, 17.5 over his career. And this year, he had over 20. The player that I'm talking about is Javon. Hey, hey, so wait, 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 wait. The player is you're gonna have to come back next week to find out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it, Johnny? It is Who Javon is Javon Baker, UCF. Uh, right. And so he Alan, he was he went to Alabama first, right? Four star okay. recruit at right. Alabama. He kind of got 
trap behind a great depth chart. Okay. Now, when I'm looking at players, it is for the NFL coaching staffs and front offices to judge character. I'm not too, I don't know. I'm not on the field. I'm not in the locker room. So there are some rumors about his personality. But as far as the field, there's no question in my mind. He is a classic X boundary outside receiver. Who's his uh, best comparable that immediately popped off the page for you for Javon Baker? I would say he's a combination of Chad Johnson of the Bengals and Terrell Owens when he was with Dallas. That's, that's like, pretty, though, yeah. That's... He's physical, but not as physical as um, Terrell Owens. But he does play with the swagger and the fortitude of Chad Johnson, which I love. Yeah. So, I get it. He yep. may be type of a locker room distraction, but I've seen enough wide receivers, right, with that alpha dog personality. And, Alan, I love him at the catch point. Like, he just wins. Like, it is so impressive, the film. Because I'll be honest, until I plugged in the numbers in the trifecta, I wasn't like, oh, my God, I've got to see Javon Baker. But then I went back to the film, Alan. Oh, my God, I loved it. He is nasty on the field. Yep. You just did a very veteran podcasting move, by the way. I can tell you've been on a lot of shows. You know what it was is that – um, we try to t- talk to our guys internally here at Rotowire too, and myself included, that we we say him too much and we don't repeat the name. So you just said Javon Baker, Javon Baker, Javon <laughs> Baker. Johnny, you can tell you've done this a few times. So that is appreciated as uh, somebody that, you know, because then people we start yelling, I just came in the middle of the conversation. I have no idea who you're talking about. So you can never say the name too much, and you did it, baby. So why did he have to transfer? You said that he just got jammed up in Alabama and then he went to Central Florida. Is that what happened? Yeah, he was with the Devonta Smith, the oh, um, okay. Gary Judy, the right. that Henry Ruggs. I mean, you right. look at the Alabama yeah. depth chart and you're like, oh, my God, they had so much talent there. And maybe, you know what, I can't discount it. Maybe his personality didn't right. rub Nick Saban. I mean, Who knows? I, I know – Young men, right? I'm a teacher. Obviously, college players are different than high schoolers. But personality plays a factor. And college coaches can put someone in a doghouse. And sometimes that's it, my friend. Like, they don't get the opportunity on the field. I don't know exactly what went on. Oh, that's a good one, too. Chris Godwin, he does have a little bit of Chris Godwin in him. I do like him a lot. Yep. Uh, So... It begs the question then, which team do you think is a good fit for Javon Baker for, for us to get the full fantasy, you know, uh, the, the full fantasy uh, gold mine from here? I mean, what's going to really maximize his output that say, I mean, do you think, well, okay, let me back this up a little bit. What ra- real NFL round will he go in? Like, will he go in the third round, the real NFL draft or the second round? I have a second round grade, but he'll go in the third. Okay. I he'll believe- go in the third. Yeah. And. I'm really hoping Kansas City or Buffalo. Oh, of course, right? I, I mean, think they, I think they could double dip at the position. Buffalo is okay. in trouble. Mm-hmm. I mean, I understand why they did what they did, but let's say they get, um, I don't know, Brian Thomas. Let's just mm-hmm. write it down. Right. Well, let's get another player. Or right. what if they go Xavier Worthy for speed and they want more of your classic X? Right. Like, and maybe Pittsburgh? Those are like maybe Pittsburgh in the three in the third round because well, they me, really good at identifying this type of player. Let me ask you this, Johnny. So if he's a fringe second round, third round guy, yeah, I mean, can't and he ends up, let's say, on a team that's just like needs talent. Will you like Baker as much if he ends up on a team like Carolina? Wow, that that not as much, but okay. I will take the value. Because right. what I've also concluded, Alan, the turnover in the NFL is faster and quicker than we've ever seen. What if Bryce Young totally bombs, which is in the realm of outcomes? I think it's likely. Okay. What? <laughs> so then Carolina changes their quarterback. All right. Then what is Javon Baker worth then if they bring in someone else? So I'm now in the fourth and fifth rounds. I'm not worried about who the quarterback or the organization, I want to get talent 
because the things change so quick in the NFL now. All right. Um, let's stick with the wide receiver position. Anybody else that you think can be a sleeper? And when we say sleeper, we don't mean that anyone watching this video or podcast, you haven't heard their name before. We just mean someone that John thinks is going to out-deliver by a significant margin what they are going to cost you in drafts and what the NFL will likely draft them at. My guy that I also love, Malik Washington. He seems to be one that I uh, his name keeps popping up here. And when smart guys like you, John, talk about... So what is it... Give me the background, because I don't know much about Malik Washington. Where did he go to school? What yeah. were some of the, uh, the key stats that popped off the page for you? So he's a fifth-year player. He went to Northwestern. And almost end of story just playing in Northwestern. If you don't know, they are going to pound the football. They don't really have NFL-level quarterbacks. He was, I think they categorized him in college, as a high school prospect, like number 23 athlete in the nation. So gotcha. If you don't do high school stuff for those tweeners, like is he a running back? Is he a wide receiver? Tight end wide, they, they call them athletes. So he ends up going there. First two years, he basically doesn't do anything, my friend. Why? Was he but buried again or just, just didn't get? It's the coaching staff, the offensive scheme. I mean, the coaching staff at that type of school, you've probably seen it, Alan. They love the upperclassmen. Okay. Right? Because what they have, they don't have elite talent. Like, they don't have Michigan-Ohio State talent. So how do you combat the 19-year-old kid like Marvin Harrison Jr., who's all world? Well, I put a fifth-year senior at quarterback and a fifth-year safety, right? Because yeah. I, I I don't have the athleticism to compete, but maybe with ex experience, you know, and some knowledge, I might be able to be competitive. And you're looking at a 22-year-old man versus a 19-year-old teenager. So a young man like Washington can be buried on a coach's depth chart freshman and sophomore year because the coaching staff just will not put him on the field, right? They also value these young men who stay for three, four years, right? Like, oh, you stayed with my program You've right. been, and let's just use this term loosely, loyal to me and the team, right? So Washington doesn't get on. Here's what's interesting. He finally starts to pop. And when I mean pop, I mean in a poor offense. He does earn third team all Big Ten his last year. And that is more significant looking back than I gave it credit for because the Big Ten is loaded with stars. Mm -hmm. And then he decides, I'm going to go to Virginia. Why? They have a unique offensive system with a great OC. Robert Ears is one of those guys who puts the ball in the air and he can feature a player. Also, Dontavian Wicks had just left Virginia, so they need that, they need that guy to come in. He had 114 receptions for over 1,400 yards, Allen. He was my waiver wire. I picked him up on like five of my seven college teams. He was unbelievable. So I'm watching him. Mm. Here's what's weird. for some, It must be for television money. Virginia played a lot of Thursday and Friday games early in the season. So, you know, what am I doing on a Thursday night in September? I'm watching ESPN football, right? Or whatever network they're on. So I'm watching a lot of this young man. I'm like, wow, this young man is pretty good, right? You start to check boxes. You, you believe your eyes when they tell yes, you something, yes. right? Yeah. It's the eyeball test. And Alan, it, I, I, I don't 100%, but there are times where you're like, and that's when I start doing the research. Why well, was, hold on. A second. I, the eyeball test gets a bad name. It, it when you understand football and you understand yes. anything in life, and then you you could see it. Your eyes process things way faster than any like the reason that a lot of people like to dive into data is to confirm the eyeball test, not yes. the other way around. That's what I do. Yeah, I use the data to confirm the eyeball test. Right, and then this is what happened. At Back to Malik the Washington. Back to Malik Washington. Yes, Malik Washington. I plug his, his numbers. Oh, my God. 
receiving yards per team pass attempt. And people say he's a slot. And I do think he's an inside slot. What's his, what's his how tall is he? What's his weight? 5'8", 192. He's very okay. well built, but short. Yep. So I do think his ceiling will be a little limited, right? Because I can't see him getting the 14 touchdown season, but that's okay. But you could see a 90 reception season, it sounds like. Yes. For 950 yards and right. seven touchdowns. In PPR, that is like every oh. week starter. Yeah. Every week starter. I couldn't believe this number. Receiving yards per team pass attempt, 3.61. I was I was blown away. For for context, for someone who doesn't follow those specific numbers, what would be a normal number? Well, Marvin Harrison Jr., yeah. 3.22. Okay, so you're talking about elite, elite. Elite, elite. Um, Brian Thomas, 2.95. Mm. All right, so that's... And here's where I loved him. Team Aerial Dominator. Allen, 47% of the offense went through Malik Washington. Yep. That's incredible. Everyone had to stop him, Allen, and no one could. I mean, right. that's just... <laughs> that's. I'm sorry. You, you, you can talk about scheme and pepper targets and no one... No one could stop him. That's, yeah, I mean... That's the same reason that they elevate Marvin Harrison because everyone knew the ball was going to him, yet yes. it still went there. And obviously, he's a different type of prospect, but apply that same philosophy to a, quote, sleeper, and we have someone that, yeah. So, all right, so where do you think, what round do you believe that um, Malik Washington will get drafted in the real NFL draft? I have a third-round grade, and I do think in the modern NFL where we now have seen Tank Dell, I do think Tank Dell is going to change how teams look because you could put Malik Washington, I believe, from day one, Allen, in the slot slash inside. And he can play. If he's on the right organization, he could have 65 receptions his rookie year wow. right off the bat. What about New York Jets at pick 72, the 10th pick of the third round? Does that sound good to you? That'd be perfect with Garrett Wilson, dude, because Malik would have advantageous matchups. The only problem is we've heard the rumors Aaron Rodgers hates rookies. But other than that, I I absolutely love it. And, and Rodgers might not be there in and, two years, right? And, so and I not love even, that spot. Yeah, not even that. I think Aaron Rodgers is in a different phase of his thing where he That's like true. his career, where he's like, if this guy's good, I'm not gonna pull the rookie thing on him. If he could play football. I got a year. I got two years. This is it. I hope so. Yes, yep. you're right about that. That's if Aaron Rodgers gets to the Jets to a Super Bowl and let's say crazily wins a Super Bowl <laughs> with the New York Jets, number one, he is, I mean, he instantly maybe eclipses um, Joe Namath. And I'll tell you why, because Jet fans back then, they weren't starving like we are now, you know? <laughs> And Aaron Rodgers, he's in the the forty plus club and does it again. Now he becomes like consideration for a Mount Rushmore quarterback. Oh, absolutely! If he brings two organizations to Super Bowl titles, he's in. Yep. He begins to get the top five consideration. I agree. Yep. Okay. Um. Ke uh, Keon Coleman, Florida State. I, I wouldn't call him a sleeper, but it seems like. You know, there's a lot of things to like, but he's polarizing. Is that a that's a yeah. good way to describe him, right? So I guess I'm going to start with where do you land on that, and then I guess explain why. I'm not a huge Keon Coleman guy. I see too many red flags. Okay, and the eyeball test isn't everything, but when I was watching a ton of Florida State football, I never once said Keon Coleman is above and beyond the best player on the team. There's one game that I hear a lot of people reference, and here's where context and just knowing college football helps. If you look at his numbers, he had this massive game against LSU. He had over three touchdowns, and he had three touchdowns and like over 140 yards. It was the opening game of the season, opening weekend, I should say. And it was highlighted on ABC or ESPN. I forget which one. But they, everyone saw the game. Here's what we didn't know, Alan. LSU would be one of the worst defenses that ever went on a college field. Their defense last year was absolutely atrocious. And that's one of the reasons why Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, 
and Brian Thomas went off because their defense was giving up 35 points a game. And that's great for fantasy. Like we loved what that offense did. So Keon Coleman produced these incredible numbers in one game against arguably one of the worst defenses I've seen in the last decade. Do I have, was it, you said it was the LSU game? Who was it? Yes, that had, okay. LSU. Right. The only reason I know that is because for player profilers uh, draft kit, I wrote him up. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And here's what's more interesting. 25% of his production came in that game against the LSU Tigers. I did the numbers. Like, I, I'm. it's like 26% of his touchdowns, 24% of his yards, 27% of it, all in one game. Yep. I don't see the separation. I get that he's big. I get that he's strong, but I don't see the separation on film. Now, I get the separation from college to the NFL is different. But when I watch Garrett Wilson, when I watch Chris Olavi, Malik Neighbors, Justin Jefferson, Allen, they're getting uber separation, six yards sometimes at college. You're yeah. not going to get that in the pros. So if Keon Coleman is bodied up at the pro level, that's a red flag to me. He's not going to get open. Also, you need a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers or Brett Favre who knows he's open when he's only got half a yard. Derek Carr, I'm just, I, I shouldn't pick on Derek Carr, but Derek Carr will never throw the football into a player who's a half yard open. He right. just doesn't do it, right? He doesn't believe in it. So what I see in Keon Coleman is I don't think he's an ex-receiver, even though he profiles on physically 6'4", 215. I think he's an inside slot receiver or a Z receiver. So is he like Traylon Burks 2.0 as far as like what we expect versus what we get? I In my book, yes. And maybe I seem to be in the rear kind of um, person who thinks that. But I'm not going to have Coleman in any. Oh, he's a fully <laughs> Jordan Matthews. That's not too bad. I mean, I won't have him. Here's two things that bother me. Receiving yards per team pass attempt, 1.62. Are you kidding me? That is that is really, really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And why did a young man who is supposedly a pro first level on an undefeated team, Allen, he only had 20% of the team aerial dominator? Like, that's... That's bizarre. Like, can you imagine LSU, Ohio State, and Alabama not peppering their stars with targets? Like, what is that? Why is FSU not even throwing it to the best player? And my friend, my friend teammate on the rookie big board, Matt Hicks, always jokes, I like my receivers who catch the football. Yeah. He had a 56% catch rate. Yeah. It's... I don't like his hands. Now, obviously, catch rate isn't the end-all and be-all because context matters at the quarterback. I understand all that. But that's a really low number. I'm just not going to have any Keon Coleman in my <clears throat> dynasty drafts. John, there's a um, a company called On Demand DFS, and if you ever think back to the golden days of <laughs> fantasy football, you know it was all about the love of the game, the camaraderie, and yes, bragging rights. Gone are the days of confusing entry fees, playing against unknown masses, or juggling multiple apps to trash talk. On Demand DFS is here to streamline your fantasy football experience, making it more about strategy, fun, and community. With On Demand DFS, you can create a contest in seconds, invite your friends, and you're off to the races. No entry fees, no gimmicks, just pure football bliss. Imagine crafting, by the way, you're not limited to the current season's players, John, because imagine crafting your dream team lineup from 5,000 NFL legends and today's stars using real historical data to simulate the action. For those who hate to wait, you'll love turbo mode. Contest wrap up in minutes, not hours. 
all excitement all the time. Download On Demand DFS app right now. Get started with a 30-day free trial. Dive into fantasy football experience that's rich history and strategy, and most importantly, fun. It's time to create your legacy with the ultimate lineup of legends and live out your fantasy football dreams like never before. There is a link in the audio and video description, and I'm telling you, man, you could just create like these super teams. We'll do this very quick, this exercise, John. Who do you think would be, if you were picking the ultimate fantasy quarterback, from you know, you don't have to remember the exact season, but like, who would be your uh, starting fantasy quarterback all time? Steve Young. Okay. The Super Peaks. Bowl year with the, I think it was ninety four. Unbelievable. He had the five hundred yards rushing, some probably seven or eight rushing touchdowns, over thirty yards, thirty touchdown passes. Yeah, ridiculous. Over four thousand yards. I mean, and he was so far ahead of the curve. I would love to see like. Steve Young versus the rest of the field. The separation was just, yes. yeah, yeah, just incredible that year. And obviously, I could go the the classic Dan Marino, nineteen eighty four. You know, Peyton Manning, two thousand ten. But I do like that Steve Young rushing upside. Now that we're in the new era, mm. I think the rushing we look at it differently than we did twenty or thirty years ago. Quickly, who would be your running back? Eric Dickerson in his prime. Ooh, 84 I, Eric Dickerson. Oh, I think he is the third best running back in my lifetime. I think he's the most underrated running back. You you watch him in those John Robinson years, his first three years in the league, dude. Like, he was all man. I mean, there, yeah. it was just simply beautiful watching well, that's, Eric Dickerson. That's a good pick, but I think a, a killer pick would have been like OJ or something like that. Oh, <laughs> first of all, Alan, I got to compliment you on two things. Your transition into the last ad was absolutely perfect. <laughs> I didn't even know you were transitioning. And second, that pun on OJ, there you while go. it might be easy, that was just perfect. Pun. Yeah, I mean, I'll take the layup when it's when it's open, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, wide receiver. Who are we taking? It was our all-time fantasy wide receiver, Johnny. I got to go Jerry Rice. In the strike shortened season of 1987, I think he had 21 touchdowns in 12 games. Yep. And again, it's the separation. What Jerry Rice did in that strike shortened season compared to anyone else is simply a cert. You could make the argument with Randy Moss with the um, Patriots. What's that? 2007, the undefeated season. Yet, he had Tom Brady one of the all-time great passing attacks in the history of the game. Jerry Rice was a one-man show in a 12-game yeah. season. And then very quickly, I think this one's an easy one, but who would be our all-time starting um, uh, fantasy tight end on DFS, uh, on on-demand DFS? Ooh. Um, I mean, I look no further go... than the modern day, right? Yeah, I mean, you. Could... it would be Gronk, Ooh. but Ooh, I didn't think uh, I'm that. a Gronk guy. Yeah. I will say this. Look at Tony Gonzalez for what he did with the Chiefs, with Trent Green and Dick Vermeil back in the day. He had some really sick seasons. So I'd have to, so it's either Gronk in his prime or Tony Gonzalez in his prime. That's fair. That's fair. I, I was going to say Travis Kelsey, but you know, I think that you highlighted uh, some, some really good guy. I mean, um, Gonzalez in his prime, Chiefs prime. That was that was something to see. All right, we're gonna we're gonna take a short break here, not for the YouTube audience, for our audio audience. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this. All right, we're back. I'm Alan Soslowski along with John Laub, and we are talking about rookie sleepers that you're gonna regret not drafting. All the smart players, John, they're not us. <laughs> All the smart players are looking at them. So uh, I think running back, um, it's not that these guys are sleepers. But there's a few guys that you're going to be able to get in the late third round. I know a lot of this will depend on landing spot. And we're recording this, obviously, before the NFL draft. But just based on talent alone, who one of the guys or, you know, start with any of the running backs that you like. And then you're going to be monitoring their landing spot a little closer because you like what you see on tape. I do like to dig a little deeper. I think if you've been listening like us, we probably have hardcore viewers right now. The guy I've really been attracted to as I've gone further into this process, Will Shipley yeah. of Clemson is just being ignored. And 
in December, I had him at number nine in my rankings. But what has happened over the course of the last couple months as I dig deeper in the film and look at the numbers, players have fallen below him. Does that kind of make sense? It's not that Shipley, he was always the same prospect. But I have moved him up as I've studied him more and more. And what really kind of finalized it, his pro day, and we know we get a little home cooking. So let's just say that. But I did not expect a 4-3-9 in the 40-yard dash for Will Shipley. I was blown away. I did not expect a 4-1-1 in the 20-yard shuttle and a 6-8-1 in the three-cone drill. And here's why athleticism to me matters. I look back. Do you know he's the only player in ACC history to be named all-conference at return specialist, all-purpose, and running back? And if you look back, he used to return punts and kicks. And I absolutely love a player who can help you on special teams early in their career. And, Alan, I've been saying this a lot in the offseason. The new kick return rules are going to make players like Will Shipley more Mm -hmm. valuable because have you looked at some of the depth charts at returns? Right. They're really bad because people have ignored them for two years, Alan. Mm -hmm. They haven't had to have a specialist. Do you think that it's time to add return yards into our fantasy leagues, John? I'm not against it. I Because, you know, I'm old school, and I, I grew up under the Bill Parcells in New York, and he always used to talk about hidden yardage, mm. and he was big into his punt returners and kick returners. And I, I can go back to George Allen with the Washington football team. Well, you know, you know yeah. who they were right. in the 70s. Right, right, right. And he was a special teams monster. And Bill Coward... And um, John Harbaugh were special teams coaches. And I think there's a lot of franchises, if they're not paying attention, they're going to fall way behind on this hidden yardage. So I do think, you know, we'd have to look at the scoring, you know, maybe well, one point this is five yards. That's but- it. You you just, yeah, and I think I just talked over you. You said one point for every 25 yards. So basically two and a half X of what it would normally be. And yeah. it's, Right, because there's going to be a lot, but I think it should be added. Um, and especially if you start a player, let's say Shipley is getting, you know, a, a clarified start. He's on a team. He was the third running back, but in week eight, he's the clarified starter. Now, is he? He's you know by most consensus rankings, let's say just hypothetically uh, that he's like RB seventeen on the week. You're going to start him in those oh, leagues yeah. because he's going to get you know another eighty return yards. So that's like an extra three, you know, whatever it is, however many points on top. So. I'm all for it. I did play a league like that about 12 years ago. Unfortunately, it didn't come back up. I would like to do it again because I agree with you on that. And then I looked at some of his numbers. He has 85 career receptions, and he's an immediate freshman star. He had over 1,100 yards, so you have the early breakout. Then you have a pass-catching chops with 85 Team scrimmage yards dominator. He hits my benchmark with 25. I don't think he's great between the tackles, but he's so good in space. And I do believe, I know there's people who will disagree with me. I believe there's a goal line back. He has good goal line abilities. Like he understands little crevices and how to get through the hole. What's his um, weight and size and all that again? 5'11", 200. Okay. So his his BMI, Allen, comes in at 29.4, just below the 30. So I'm going to say he's in the range, the margin of error on BMI. And we're seeing more and more uh, undersized running backs get yes. utilized. I mean, look at Kyron Williams, man. Nobody thought he could be a 30-touch player and certainly was. You could point to scheme and this and that, but bottom line is it actually happened. Uh, what do you think is the perfect landing spot uh, as far as team for, for Shipley? I do think Dallas in the third or fourth round because he has a unique skill set where he can help them all over. He doesn't fit San Diego in my book. He doesn't look like a Jim Harbaugh type back because Harbaugh wants you to dominate between the tackles. Or I think the Giants is a landing spot we're not talking about enough. 
I agree I mean, with you there. I go home. <laughs> let me just let me just jump in here. Who the yeah. hell loves Devin Singletary? He's like a lead back. Now, again, he showed pretty well for fantasy football as a Houston Texan, but we all know that he is he's not that guy and he's not the guy in Buffalo. He's somewhere in between, even if you think he's good. So there is room for a yes. fourth round rookie running back to have an immediate role in fantasy football. And I and I like that you just called them out. I I I thought of it, but never vocalized it. So that's a great take there, Johnny. Yeah, I think the Giants are a sneaky spot. And, and Alan, we know with their injuries, can the Giants really go in with the current depth chart at running back? I mean, that's insanity if you ask me. So I think they're going to pluck a running back in the fourth round. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. I believe I'm just pulling it up here. They do have an early pick. Did they have it? In, let's see, in the fourth in the fourth, yeah, no, they have their pick. They have pick 107. So that seems like it seems like a lot of these running backs are that's might be the sweet spot. Um, do you think we're gonna see a second round running back this year in the real NFL draft, John? If there is, it'll be one. But who I, will, don't, who, I who will I be? Under. Who sorry, will well. it be? Who will it be? See, so I think the NFL is gonna like him more than I do, but it might be Trey Benson. I'm not a Trey Benson guy, but I see the upside and the speed size combo is hard for teams to ignore. But if you're going to ask me one player who sneaks into the second, it might be Trey Benson. I, I'm hearing a lot of Jonathan Brooks to Dallas at 56, but here's the issue I have with that. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're shaking your head no for the audio audience here is that can you really draft a guy that has the torn ACL and – I mean, I don't know. Maybe you can because the, the Lions took Jamison Williams in the first round and traded up for him. So, but do you shake your no because of the ACL or just because? Okay, explain. I'll, I'll let you uh, take the wheel here. The Cowboys have actually been pretty smart with their draft. They've done good drafts overall. If you look at since Jerry Jones has led his sons. I was going to say no thanks to Jerry who wanted <laughs> no, to take man, Johnny Manziel over Zach Martin, right? Yes. But the, the, the Suns have done a better job. I cannot. They need help in the back. Is, am I correct? Is Rico Dottle right now at the top of the depth chart? Yeah, right. it's, it's like a, it's a depth chart of Rico, Malik Davis, and Hoyce, a Royce Freeman. <laughs> There's no way, dude. So uh, they need someone who can contribute immediately. Rumors, though, of Zeke return. Well... <laughs> Oh my God, that would be just Jerry giving him money. Here you go, like son, have some more money. Right. Like, how can you bring Zeke back? Zeke did did look okay on New England, though. He didn't look like he oh. was dead. No, but he did look better in New England. Yeah. But I mean, I you can't to Dallas. They need an explosive game breaker in that role who can play immediately. I. If you're going to go Jonathan Brooks as Dallas, he's a third or fourth round pick because you can wait on him. But you need an immediate player. I'm looking at Jalen Wright or Trey Benson or Marshawn Lloyd. I think one of those three are in Dallas. Is what did you say? Number 56 in the second round? Yes. You got to have a player who can step on the field, don't you, Allen? I mean, uh, yes, especially this is the year where they're like, hey, are we going to like commit to Dak? Are we going to yes. commit to our coach? You know, you don't need like, hey, we'll get our second round pick needs to contribute this year. I agree. A hundred percent agree. Yep. OK, so we're in the same. So, OK, so you think more likely that we'll see the first running back pop off in the uh, third round. I'm going to start naming teams in the order they're drafting that we know trades happen. Uh, people, uh, teams use third round picks to move up and down the boards in the early rounds, but you just tell me the team. Stop me when you think there's the team that's going to take the first running back. Okay. Okay. Carolina, Arizona, Washington, New England, the Chargers, the Chargers, and New England. Okay. Okay. I think we right there. Okay. Chargers. The obvious would be that um, Blake Corum, right? To with with Harbaugh to the Chargers. Yes. But I'm all, I'm actually starting to say, is that too obvious? And Harbaugh is looking at someone else, right? Like you, you get this Greg Roman, you know, you get Roman and Harbaugh, and everyone knows they like Corm. I mean, he's got to like Corm. But right, is he actually looking at 
a Braylon Allen, mm. a Kamani Vidal. In round three, those guys, those seem like later round guys if you, but. But Harbaugh likes the between the tackles grinder. Like, 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 look at what they've done with Gus Edwards in Baltimore. Is like, it just appears that Roman and Harbaugh have a guy. And here's what I'll say, Alan. Anyone who thinks Harbaugh and Roman are doing anything different, I don't know what you're drinking. They have a they have a plan. And what what have they shown us to deviate from that plan? They're going to run the football between the tackles. Let me repeat that. They are going to run the football between the tackles. Now, if they get a dynamic quarterback like Colin Kaepernick or they or Lamar Jackson, they can run the quarterback between the tackles. Herbert is not in that boat, but he has some rushing ability. They're going to find a guy to pound the ball 225 times between the tackles. I, I just, there's no way they don't. So what does this mean for Justin Herbert and fantasy football? I mean, the dynasty market has reacted pretty quickly to this. Like he's no longer a first round, even super flex startup pick. I mean, he goes in the second round. I mean, high in the second round. Um, are you, do you think that this is going to be a down year for Herbert? And when I say that, it means like QB 11 to 14 finish. I think he's outside the top 12. I'm not going to draft him where he's going. And in dynasty leagues, if I'm looking at three years of Harbaugh and Roman, Mm. There's no way he finishes where he should be based on ability and last couple seasons. I'm out on Justin Herbert. I'm totally out. If you had pick um, 1.11 in your rookie draft, John Superflex, would you add that pick to Justin Herbert to get up to like, say someone like Anthony Richardson in to, to make a trade? Or is that you'd rather just wait, roll the dice with Herbert and keep the pick? No, I'd rather have Anthony Richardson than Herbert and the pick. Okay. Without question. And I think that's a trade that you could actually make. Oh, yeah. I think the upside of Richardson there, and we love the rushing court running back, quarterback. I'm sorry. We mm-hmm. love that. And Herbert, what's he going to do? What's his ceiling? 3,800 yards and 25 touchdowns? Would your mind would your mind switch a little bit if they draft Marvin Harrison or Malik Neighbors? Pick five. Yes, I would, but I can't imagine them doing that. But I would switch if one of those players end up there. I mean, so maybe you don't make that trade just yet. The one that we just outlined, you wait and see. Yes, that might be better. Yes. Right. So you think at pick five that the Chargers might take Joe Alt or a non? Okay. They go offensive line. I just, I mean. Or trade out. Or trade out. The best quote I read, because, you know, I followed Harbaugh all the way back to when he played at Michigan. So I. The best quote, and I paraphrase, he goes, in football, everything on offense depends on the offensive lineman. He's not wrong. Everything. The quarterback must have blocking. The receivers, the blocks must hold up. Running backs can't run without the holes being open. Like, literally, everything is dependent on the five guys up front. I don't see how he transitions out of that. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Or they could trade back if they yes, like, yeah. If they, yeah, if they like, you know, and I mean, with Minnesota, right. I mean, there's yeah. a possible, you know, so say Arizona takes wide receiver one, whoever their wide receiver one is and McCarthy's on the board the team wants to trade up. There's your trade back partner. Uh, we didn't talk about tight end and everyone agrees. Brock Bowers is the tight end one tight end two is up for grabs, John. So when we talk about sleepers, I'm even saying who's your tight end two, And that's a real sleeper in, in a sense where, are rookie drafts, you're not going to even have to spend, you know, the first 20 picks on the player. I'm big. There's two who are probably third round dynasty depending on landing spot. But I have a little different in my rankings. I'm all in on Ben Sinat out of Kansas State, my friend. Six okay. four two fifty. I watch a lot of Big 12 football. While they have gotten better at defense over the last three or four years, and people don't realize they've actually improved on the defensive side of the football, this isn't the Patrick Mahomes era of Big 12 football. Yet, Ben Sinat dominated in the the Wildcats offense for Kansas State. I did not realize how athletically gifted 
he actually was until he went to the combine. Because I'm always a healthy skeptic, my friend. Because it's hard to tell defensive players at non-SEC schools, non-Big Ten, right? How fast are the linebackers and the safeties in the Big 12? But when he went to the combine, I could not believe the high-level athleticism that Benson not had. 4.6968 in the 40-yard dash. 4.23 in the 20-yard shuttle. And 6.82, he... He was below all my benchmarks that I'm looking for. Highly athletic. For a big man to have speed, acceleration, and burst. And I like the film. We can argue. I mean, it's not like Kansas State's the most progressive passing game. You know, they kind of have that dual threat quarterback who's a good thrower, not an elite thrower. Will Howard was a better runner than he was a passer. But Benson not dominated. 64% 64% catch rate, 22% aerial dominator at tight end. He hits all my benchmarks that I like. He's uber athletic. I think he goes in the second round of the wow. NFL draft. You think he's tight end too, and by real NFL standards? You see, there's a lot of NFL guys who like Jatavian Sanders. Right. He's the Texas uh, yeah, tight end. Yeah, he's okay. the Texas guy. So if Sanders went second round before Sanat, I would not be surprised. But what if Kansas City's sitting there? Do they have pick 64? Um, I think at, they do. I got, my, I got my full board right here. Yes, they yeah, do. Yeah. He might be sitting there for the Chiefs at 64. We know Kelsey's getting older in the teeth. And there's no one else I love who's a tight end who can three years. Ben Sinat might be the starter in a team like Kansas City. Yeah. So you're saying is that um, this guy's like pass catcher, right? He's not like oh. can be stuck blocking or anything like that. No, he can't block though. But that's why I like because okay. he's he's a efficient run blocker. But you've got to put him out on the routes. What is it about Sanders that people like? Sanders, so it's funny, people said Sanders was more athletic, but when you actually put him in the model, he didn't profile as good as Sanat. And I'll say this, I'm a skeptic. He did not run the 20-yard shuttle or the three-cone drill at the combine. Alan, what is he hiding? Mm. Like, if you were that uber-athletic, like, I understood why Sanat had to run those, right? Because people weren't grading him that high. Sanders was a tick 4.69 slower, a little slower than Ben Sinat. I have some questions, and here's what really bothers me about Sanders. He's a terrible run blocker. Mm. And I'm sorry, you know all NFL coaches want those run blocks. Now, he might be Evan Ingram, I get it. But I looked at Evan Ingram was a better tape evaluation coming out of Mississippi than Jatavian's in my book, mm-hmm. than Jatavian Sanders coming out of Texas. So I don't think he's as good as Evan Ingram. And then Evan Ingram was like an all-world athlete when you put him underneath the microscope and you looked at the times. So I don't think he's as good as Evan Ingram. But there are people who do think he's this uber-talented number two tight end. I just have some red flags. When we talk about sleeper players, uh, everybody knows Bo Nix in the quarterback position and Michael Penix. Those guys right now are, you know, it's 50-50 whether they're going to go in the first or second round. Their pick uh, their pick prop is at 32 and a half, which basically means are they going to be a first or a second rounder? Of those two guys, which one do you think, and I know it's all team context dependent, but just based on what you've evaluated, which one has the better chance to one, be successful in the NFL and two, to have fantasy football upside? Great question. I'm going Bo Nix because of the rushing equity upside. Just as a comparison, over his five years, Bo Nix had 1,600 yards rushing. I don't know if that is actually people understand how good he's been as a runner over his career because of Michael Penix with the two injuries, there is a tale of two careers. You look at him at Indiana when his knees were healthy and he was strong and young, he ran, Yeah. but then he had those two catastrophic injuries and he moves to Washington 
What were the injuries? And, were they ACLs? Yeah. Okay. And yep. he changed. He's he's athletic because we saw the forty time at the pro day. But Allen, he changed his game, and he probably was smart to do so because of the injuries. So what does that tell me? He's very good in the pocket. He can avoid the pass rush but I don't think of him as a 400-yard rusher. I want a bare minimum, at Justin Herbert rushing. I want 400 yards rushing out of my quarterback in general, right? I mean, of course I take Patrick Mahomes right now. I don't know if he's ever going to get 400 again. But when I'm looking at a young quarterback for fantasy and dynasty football, do I get 400 yards in the first three years of his career? or each season. Bo Nix can do that. I don't think Michael Penix can do that. Bo Nix, what's the team that you think he has the best chance for fantasy success? He's obviously been tied to Denver. Is that the team? Do you think Denver, the Raiders? What do you think it is? I think it's Denver. I do believe that Peyton would know how to coach him up and use his skill set. Now, here's what's interesting. If you watch Peyton coach offense over the years, And this is why I think Russell Wilson and him did not work out. Peyton wants two things. Get the ball out of your hand within a second. How many of those quick throws did Drew Brees make? And two, you have to be able to complete the 12-yard pass on a rope, right? Marquise Colston, Michael Thomas, running that quick slant, right? Boom. See it? Get the ball out. Michael Penix is a deep thrower, uber good deep thrower. Peyton wants you to move the football and take your shots when they come, when we call it. Bo Nix, if you watched him at Oregon, you can say what you want about his A dot and his yards per pass attempt, but you know why they're low? The system had him get the ball. Boom, 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 boom. I think he fits the Sean Payton system. See it, read it, throw it. Like, don't, son. And what was Russell Wilson? Mm, Looking around, like the scramble, throw the ball deep, right? But he didn't have Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, right? And I think the one, I can't wait till someone writes the report. What did Peyton say to Russell Wilson when he pulled him out of that game? What I think, he saw Russell Wilson not, let it rip on those in routes. And he just had 14 games on film. Dude, Jerry Judy's open. Cortland Sutton's open. Marvin, what are you doing? Because if you look before he pulled them, Denver was within the, the red zone. I think they were within the 10. And Russell Wilson went the back, went back the pass twice, and he didn't let the ball rip. Hmm. And he can't take that pain. Like you saw, I told you to throw it there and Russell didn't throw it. So this begs the question then we'll do quick uh, follow-ups here. Do you think Jerry Judy has a chance to actually realize his upside in Cleveland? More so than he does d- d- did in Denver, but the depth chart is a little daunting, but he has potential. Yes. I mean, they just gave him, you know, a pretty know. sizable contract. He's going to be on the field at least to, to start maybe. Uh, and then, do you think that Russell Wilson is going to be and combine that with Arthur Smith? Is this bad news for George Pickens? I think it's terrible news for George Pickens, but I've seen enough of Russell Wilson, dude. I I, I get it. You're going to be 500 with him. He's better than Penny K- Kenny Pickett, but I have questions. Will he fit you, into that Steelers? You're about to call him Penny Kick it. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip on that one. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably a better name for him. <laughs> All right. All right, John. John Lab, you did it, baby. You follow him as I do at Grid Iron Skull 91. That's G R I D I R O N S C H O L 91. Uh, all of his information is linked in the video description below. John, what's the one piece of content right now that you're working on, you're most proud of that you need? Everyone here needs to leave the stream and go check out right away. Um, All of my position rankings with the full model. So I have 40 receivers, 33 running backs, 14 quarterbacks, 12 tight ends. Go to player profiler. 
If you go to each position scouting report, there's a link and you can see all of my model, how I graded and ranked these players. And when we were talking about our trifecta for wide receivers, you can see all the players in all three of those statistical categories and why I rank certain players as I do. Oh, by the way, I never asked you, who's a sleeper quarterback real quick? Someone that is probably going to be taking in the third round or late second round of the NFL draft that you think has a chance to be a Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson. You know what I mean? I don't mean those types, but just late round starter eventually. Spencer Rattler of Oklahoma or South Carolina. I think the Giants or someone in the third round is going to like the arm strength. 46 games started in college. I think he, if Tommy DeVito could play, there's no question in my mind that Spencer Rattler can play quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's fair, right? Uh, but, um, is Who's your best comparable for Rattler? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, we only ask good questions on this podcast. We don't <laughs> ask you know what? A young Russell Wilson. Oh, there it is. There it is. A young Russell Wilson. All right, everybody, right now we're going to give you two free days of Rotowire Premium, our website, right? You go to rotowire.com slash pod, rotowire.com slash pod. You just put in your email and the paywall unlocks. You get all the premium content, draft stuff, baseball, everything you can. Now, after the two days lapses, John, it just shuts off. Like you don't have to like cancel. <laughs> How many times do you have to like put in your credit card for a free trial and then you have to remember to cancel it and then the month goes by, then you have to call. That doesn't happen. You just put in your email, rotowire.com slash pod, put in your email, paywall unlocks for two days. You go check out everything. And if you like what you see, you can sign up. If you don't, we never have to talk again. Or you can just enjoy all the free stuff that we put out. All right, baby, you did it. Uh, by the way, you can follow me at Alan Sislowski. Uh, If you enjoy videos like this, just remember to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, get notifications when we put out new video every week. And we'll be back next week with another Dynasty Fantasy Football podcast.